you think about this aircraft flying for five, six, seven decades, the pilots that pilot this haven't probably even been born yet. This is the Tempest, or is it? This is just one potential concept, what it might look like. It's to describe a vision more than anything else. It's to, to put something tangible in people's minds. As to what the Tempest future fighter might look like, um, that's undefined yet. That This might be a smaller aircraft, it might be a bigger aircraft, it might have loyal wingmen of unmanned air vehicles uh, alongside it whenever it's sent into theatre. That we, we don't fully know what it will look like, but we know that in 2040 onwards, uh, we will have a, an emerging and enhancing threat that we need to develop technologies and capabilities to really overcome. So the pilot might be flying this aircraft, which will be the central aircraft, and then there might be small smaller, less costly unmanned air vehicles flying alongside him, which could, which could act as decoys. Um, he'll be able to fly those, but they'll be uh, much smaller, uh, less capable aircraft, and this will be the centre capability which he will fly. Since 2003, the Typhoon has been at the forefront of RAF operations. But in 15 years' time, the Tempest will take over and bring with it a whole new generation of weapons. The environment's changing um, so, and the threat's changing and therefore um, we are looking at um, laser-directed energy weapons. Um, they're around and about on the ships and there's other countries investing in them as well. Um, but what we are taking a role on Tempest with our partners is, um, is to actually try and integrate them onto an air platform. So this would be the first fast jet with a laser directed energy weapon on it. The threat of the future um, and the threat of now actually is very low cost cheap weapons that are sort of offensive weapons to us. So therefore it's a great defensive mechanism as well for a future air platform. And what can it do that a missile can't? It's incredibly accurate. Um, the details of which I can't say, um, but it can be incredibly accurate. We're looking at everything from within flight systems areas, we're looking at battery technologies and, and using a lot less hydraulics. In the cockpit, we're looking at using augmented reality and virtual reality and trying to take a lot of the hardware away from that cockpit environment. And, and that serves two purposes. It, it allows very quick, upgradable software approaches and it takes away weight and it takes away cost. Um, and, it, and it allows the pilot to do a lot more. And, and that might be that he might be engaged with the unmanned air aircraft that fly alongside this in a system of systems and and we're working on strategies to work, understand how there is a manned unmanned team arrangement that says when does the the pilot take control of an unmanned air vehicle and when does it let it make its own decision we will always want a pilot in in the center of that and we will always want to make sure that he's in control however we're looking at autonomous systems that can switch on and switch off different activities for the pilot and we're using things like cycle physiological monitoring of the pilot so we're trying to determine without the pilot needing to tell us from his biometrics how might he be becoming overloaded and at that point we might take activities away from him and and that's a that's a real area of focus because um, you need to make sure that there's a real robust approach to that. We're obviously exploring stealth capabilities on the aircraft, uh, flexible payload bays because the future of weapons could look very different to what they look like today. Um, so we're looking at um, options to have flexible payload bays, have different missiles all contained within it. We've, we've got to do this in timescales that support Typhoon going out of service, which means that we've got to do this in half the time. So when we get to a, a key milestone, which is 2025, where we go through a, a final investment decision, we'll have uh, 10 years to get this into service. And, and that's a real challenge. And, and we've got a, as, as the whole industry is probably an aging demographic in, in engineering that you need to transfer the capabilities into the younger generation. So we'll, we'll do that, but another part of this is making sure that that younger generation is also bringing new ideas and new ways of working because 
we're, we're well aware that if we do the same things we've always done, we're not going to do this in half the time and significant cost reduction. If you think about this aircraft flying for five, six, seven decades, the pilots that pilot this haven't probably even been born yet. Um, some of them may have even just started school, um, but that, that's, as, that's as far as it will go because this will go into service in 2035 and we'll probably fly out well into the 2070, 2080s. For BAE Systems and the other manufacturers working on this project, they understand just how important the Tempest is to the future of British defence. It feels like a once in a generation opportunity and, and the whole team know that, the whole team know that they're working on something that is probably unprecedented. The challenges that we're trying to overcome are unprecedented. And, but it's really exciting and the team feel a sense of responsibility. Yes, it's right at the cutting edge and we're trying to push it as fast as we can, but we also know there's a lot of technology that we don't even fully understand yet. So we're, we're building it to try and future-proof it so that it's easily upgradable. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel.